Consider, for example, that textbook, Pandas and People, which was purchased for the Dover School District. When you read Pandas and People, it doesn't sound like it is religious at all. Darwin is subject to intelligent design, doesn't give a natural thing. Intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency. It sounds pretty scientific. It turns out this is only the latest version. And pandas and people existed as an earlier draft. We didn't know this until the lawyers subpoenaed the publisher and asked for copies of the earlier versions of this book. And when we saw these earlier versions, we just about fell over. The earlier versions talk about the creation view. Creation means the various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent creator. And in fact, when you hold these two up next to each other, what you discover is incredible. There is paragraph after paragraph in the early and the later versions of the book that read essentially identical, except a global word processor has changed creator to designer, has changed creation to intelligent design. How do you make an intelligent design textbook? You take a creation textbook and change the word create to the word design. And this was abundantly clear. Now, Barbara Forrest, an expert in the history of this idea, got all of the earlier versions. And what she did was she graphed the numbers, the number of mentions of creationism and the number of mentions intelligent design in the earlier versions. And you will notice that something remarkable happened in 1987, which is the mention of creation dropped to almost zero and the mention of intelligent design moved up to take its place. Now, I don't know what you conclude about this. We'll get to 1987 in just a second. But my first reaction when I saw all these older versions is, my god, didn't these people learn anything from the Nixon administration? Burn this stuff! <laughs> but it wasn't burned, and it's still around, and we know what's going on. Now, some of you may know what it was that happened in 1987. But for those of you who don't know, this is a timeline showing a, 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 you might say, a legal history of litigation regarding evolution in various courts. And what happened in 1987 is a Supreme Court decision known as Edwards versus Aguilar that identified creationism as a religious doctrine. Literally within a month of that decision, the drafts changed from creation and creationism to intelligent design and designer. Basically, there's no question that this was simply relabeling the old product with new pack packaging to make it palatable. And again, this is something else that came out remarkably so at the trial. And what the judge wrote is the plaintiffs meticulously presented. You had to be there to see this. Several drafts, some of which were completed prior to and after the comport decisions. And three astonishing points emerge. One, definition of creation science is identical to the definition of intelligent design. Cognates of the word creation appeared about 150 times, were deliberately and systematically replaced with ID, and the changes occurred right after the Supreme Court said that creation science is religious. So the history of this was very straightforward. Um, the members of the, the judge also wrote, um, and this was an extraordinary thing to hear. I'm going to move my lapel pin down by my microphone so you can hear the audio clip in just a second. The judge says, you know, the citizens of the Dover board uh, of Dover were very poorly served by members of the board who voted for the ID policy. Here are two of them up here, former members of the board, now voted out of office. To me, it's remarkable to hear a federal judge talk this way. It is ironic that several of these individuals who so staunch and proudly touted their religious convictions in public would time and time again lie to cover their tracks and disguise the real purpose behind the ID policy. I don't know about you, but I didn't know federal judges talked like that. And I found that absolutely astonishing. Now, there is at least one, sorry, there is at least one person who understood what the policy was all about. All of you know who that person is, and he called it exactly right. Here he is. Last month, the people of Dover, Pennsylvania, voted to dismiss school board members who supported the theory of intelligent design. But according to some people, that's not all they voted out. I'd like to say to the good citizens of Dover, uh, if there is a disaster in your area, don't turn to God. You just voted God out of your city. <laughs> Pat got it right. Um, 
This really is a religious idea. And what's astonishing is to see Robertson saying exactly what this is all about. And once again, I think uh, uh, regardless of what you think of the Reverend Robertson, um, I think he was exactly right from his point of view that this was a religious question. Now, um, the question I think that all of you in Ohio have to consider is, is this critical analysis lesson plan that you now have in Ohio, is this really different from the Dover approach? And I've read opinion columns saying immediately, oh, no, it's got nothing to do with it. It's entirely different. The Dover decision is not precedent. That's true. It's just a district court decision. But all of the information that I have talked about tonight was unearthed at the Dover trial, and it's all available. After all, the Discovery Institute came here and told you, didn't they, that they do not want to teach intelligent design in public schools. That's just not their policy. Yeah? That's Stephen Meyer. He's the guy who said that. Stephen Meyer is the author of a book called How to Get Intelligent Design into Public School Curriculum. So if you hear him saying momentarily, no, we don't want to teach intelligent design in Ohio schools, I think the proper way to understand that is we don't want to teach intelligent design in Ohio schools yet. We'll figure out a way to do that. Um, and the lesson plans, of course, don't have anything to do with creationism or intelligent design, do they? Well, guess what? If you look very closely at those lesson plans, what you will discover is the topics for the five lesson plans. Of those five lesson plans, four of them come directly out of the Pandas and People book, the creationist book that was relabeled as an intelligent design textbook. And the fifth one comes directly from Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box. These are also found in a whole series of other uh, intelligent design textbooks, including Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells. And you might ask yourself, well, are any of these really intelligent design books? Go to the Discovery Institute website, and you will find that these are touted as the source books of intelligent design. And the judge realized that correctly, and he wrote something that I think applies directly to Ohio, and as, as I think worth thinking about. And that is intelligent design's backers have sought to avoid the scientific scrutiny, which we have now determined that it cannot withstand by advocating that the controversy, but not ID itself, should be taught. And what Judge Jones wrote was this tactic is at best disingenuous and at worst a canard. The goal of the intelligent design movement isn't to encourage critical thought, but to foment a revolution which would supplant evolutionary theory with ID. And that is part and parcel of the lesson plans now adopted in the state of Ohio. Um, people might say, well, let's be fair. Um, isn't the scientific community biased against intelligent design? Isn't it prejudiced? Doesn't it suppress it? Um, I think that idea under overlooks how often science deals with novel scientific claims. But what we expect people to do is to do real research to back up those claims, to submit them to peer review, to engage in the give and take of scientific argument, to win a scientific consensus, and eventually, if the evidence is on the side of these ideas, no matter how goofy they sound at first, and no matter how much the scientific community opposes them, they will eventually find their way into classroom and textbook. Now, intelligent design advocates like to say they've got a new scientific idea, too. And you know what? If they wanted to do this, I'd be thrilled. I'd say, see at the cell biology meetings, see at biochemistry, see at the earth science meetings. We'll have fun. We'll argue about this. And I'll show you that you're full of it. But you know what? Maybe you'll do the same thing to me. Maybe you'll come up with the experiments, with the evidence, with the analysis that will show you're right. And if you are right, in 10, 15, 20 years, we won't have to go to the school board and argue. You'll automatically be in classroom and textbook. But their idea of how the scientific process should work is not exactly like this. It is rather like this. And that is they would like a direct injection into classroom and textbook. And they'd like that injection with the aid of the political process, which is exactly why they've concentrated not on research. They don't produce any. Not on peer-reviewed publications and not on winning scientific consensus. What they have concentrated on is public relations and political pressure.